bienvenidos al seminario web. Ha entrado como asistente en modo de solo estudio. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar focused on gender, disability and social inclusion. I am Jackie Garcia and I'm part of the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge team and the facilitator of this webinar today. While we are waiting uh, for all the other attendees to, to log in, I just want to give you as a reminder that these webinars are designed to the, for the participants of the Dis Efficiency for Access Design Challenge which is an initiative led by the Efficiency for Access with support from Engineers Without Borders UK. This webinar is being recorded and the cameras and microphones are disabled except for those of the main speakers. But you all can use the chat box to make any comments or questions for our speakers at, the, uh, at any time. And we will be discussing them at the end of the presentation. So please uh, share your comments and questions. Today, in the agenda, we will have uh, Jenny Green will give us an overview of the challenges and opportunities of gender inclusion. Richa Goyal will give us an overview of the challenges and opportunities of disability and access to energy. And Katrina P Pieli will give us an overview of the challenges and opportunities of social inclusion within the off-grid sector and the importance of leaving no one behind. The Q&A section at the end of the presentations is your time to ask the speakers for um, questions. So please write your questions and comments in the chat throughout the webinar. And at the end, you will have the opportunity to give your opinion in a very short survey on your experience in this webinar to help us improve uh, for future webinars. I would like to introduce you uh, our speakers today. Jenny works as a managing partner for Sustainable Energy Solution, a consulting firm established in 1996, where she has specialized in gender and energy-related assignments, mostly in Africa. Her professional projects span policy, finance, enterprise development, and environmental sustainability. She has a master from Columbia University and a bachelor degree from Brown University. She speaks French and Arabic and lives in the southeastern United States, in the same town where she was born, buttress by family, including two young children and a husband with a restaurant, a mixed flock of poultry, a large dog, and a cherished vegetable garden. <laughs> Risha serves as the research co-lead for the Efficiency for Access Coalition and as the senior insight manager at the Energy Saving Trust. She is an energy access expert with more than 11 years of professional experience. Her professional projects span the themes of sustainable development goals, impact, and intended environmental consequences, responsible and inclusive energy access, life cycle impact assessment, and business model innovations across Africa and India. Ms. Goyal background is in empirical development economics, climate change, and energy policy. She has a master's degree in economics from Anna University, and in her free time, she likes to learn classical Hindustani music, cook and practice martial arts. Ms. Pieli serves as a board trustee for Energy for Impact and is a steering committee member of the Sustainable Energy for All, energy, Energizing Finance Research Series. She provides expert services to advance energy initiatives globally through working with government leaders, private sector companies and associations, and other international organizations to achieve energy and climate goals. At UC8, Ms. Pieli served as a director of the Scaling of Grid Energy Grant Challenge for Development and developed and led Power Africa's Off-Grid Energy Access Program called Beyond the Grid as a senior program director and energy access expert where she worked to develop and implement innovative, meaningful programs and public-private partnerships. And now 
without further ado, I will give the floor to Jenny to Thank start you. with the first presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. It's nice to be with you today. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so my name is Jenny Green. Uh, I live in the U.S. and I've been um, researching and writing on uh, gender and energy issues for a few years now. Um, before the uh, uh, before the presentation starts, I had some questions um, sent out to the group um, about hand drills at a local home improvement store near where I live. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to quickly look. It's just a one minute video and a picture. Um, but if you would like to um, put your comments about uh, these two items into the chat box, um, we can uh, discuss those. Uh, or you can just read what uh, how everyone else responds um, and as we go. I mean, the question is, is like, you know, how are tools designed? Who are they designed for? You know, is it appropriate um, to do these things? Okay, next slide. Um, and then just as a, you know, I do have one of these pink tools. Um, and the reason I have it is not because I have a deep connection to like the gendered colored pink. It's because it keeps my husband from stealing my tools and walking off with them. So I actually found it very helpful to have a pink uh, power drill. Uh, next slide. And although the uh, the executive who's speaking in the video clip obviously maybe could have phrased his comments differently, um, there are probably differences in hand sizes between different races and ethnicities. Um, so the fact that at least they were thinking along those lines, you know, perhaps it, it is not such a bad thing. Um, maybe drills should be available in a much wider range of sizes um, and they shouldn't all just be designed for you know whoever the dominant group is okay next slide so i actually wanted to start um the main conversation uh today thousands of years ago um the plow was a terrific energy intervention in that it multiplied more than five times the available energy uh, that farmers could use um, to till soil so over there on the right you see the you know the power and the speed plotted out for different types of draft animals. Okay, next slide. Um, but the plow also changed gender dynamics potentially in a really great way. Um, I mean, a really terrible way, but like great as an in, in order of magnitude, you know, very important way. Uh, the great Esther Bozerup posited that um, in plow cultures, there was greater division of labor because once people began plowing, uh, it favored individuals with greater upper body strength. It was capital intensive to have this big farm implement and to have the animals to go with it. It was hard to start and stop frequently. Um, so it wasn't really compatible with having children nearby, the young children that you're caring for. Uh, so when plows were introduced into cultures, we, uh, she posited that we, we start to see more sexual division of labor and then attendant increases in gender in, inequality. And actually, um, some researchers uh, about 10 years ago empirically found evidence of this, correlating um, soil types and, and climate conditions with present day measures of gender inequality. And they found that a lot of these correlations have, um, have held up over time. So the whole point of this is just to say that technology is not neutral. It is embedded within um, a web of social relationships and it has to be understood uh, as such. Next slide. So, one helpful term to think about this is to consider technology as uh, socio-technical rather than just purely technical. Um, gender and energy discourse has a pretty long history of, uh, you know, uh, 40 to 50 years. I won't read all of this, but basically it starts mostly focused on women as victims, looking at cooking uh, solutions, and then over time, the, the number of different energy solutions uh, that are examined expands, the role of, of women is understood in more nuanced ways, and researchers and practitioners move from talking about women to talking about um, gender. Uh, next slide. Um, so one uh, important process to keep in mind is this process uh, of appropriation. Um, so how does it happen and why does it happen is that those are important things to understand. Um, in one case, appropriation is a good thing because it means people are starting to use and adapt for their own purpose, you know, the, the appliance or the device. But in certain cases, it can have negative consequences if one group um, appropriates, you know, an appliance or technology uh, for itself to the exclusion of other groups. 
Uh, one example of, of this that I wasn't aware of until just a few years ago was that computing actually started out as a very female um, gendered in, endeavor or technology. Um, and then over time, it became more and more um, male dominated as it, as it was appropriated. Next slide. Um, and this slide just points out how sometimes appropriation um, is good. Like for example, if it encourages men to do, to share more in the housework, um, you know, that, that's a good thing. Other times it can be bad. Like for example, um, if men are typically the individuals in a society who own houses and houses are the things that electricity connections run through and then all appliances purchased in that house kind of by default also become male linked assets. Um, you know, that can be a problematic aspect of, uh, of appropriation. Uh, next slide. So most often in this day and age, people speak about gender and, and not necessarily sex, but I think both may be important for the work that you're doing. Gender is something that is socially or individually determined. Um, you know, it's, it's constructed. It has to do with the roles that we play and how people treat us based on how they perceive us. Gender looks different in every context. It can look different from country to country, from town to town. Um, there's not, it's not monolithic. It's really hard to say, oh, all women do this or all men do that. And it's not binary. You know, a lot of places we see third genders and, you know, even fourth and fifth genders. Um, it's a very, it's a very fluid concept and it, it evolves in time. Sex, on the other hand, uh, does have a biological or physical basis. Um, but what I want to emphasize with sex is that there's really more commonality between the sexes than there are differences uh, between them. For example, there are many women who are taller than many men. Um, so it's not to say that all women are shorter, um, but that if we take a population average and plot out the distribution, you know, the male average may be higher than the female average in some cases. And there again, sex is also not a, a binary thing. Um, you know, I think biologists and researchers have been working for years. Uh, and have found that, you know, depending on which marker you use and, and how you try and characterize it, um, it's also not, not really binary. Uh, next slide. So speaking of sex and physical differences, um, my point here is that, you know, designing for a male is norm customer uh, can't just be replaced by, you know, a two size fits all solution, but really it needs to think about how many sizes and, and configurations do you need to really capture all of the potential customers? Um, over here on the right-hand side, you see a DC uh, mill for millet. And I mean, I, I wasn't familiar with this project. I just grabbed the photo from the internet. Uh, but you see, it looks to me like it would be very hard to adjust the height. And it also looks to me like it would require a lot of upper body strength to like dump loads of millet into the, into the feeder. Um, and it looks to me like that that's maybe a machine that would be um, easier to use if you were tall and if you had a lot of upper body strength. Whereas in the middle, you can see some appliances developed by Agsol that also perform like milling and, and husking type tasks. Um, and they're all tabletop appliances. So you can adjust the height based on, you know, how short or tall your, your table is, you know, which, which could be helpful. Uh, also, you see some LPG cylinders over there in the, um, in the left-hand corner. I think a lot of companies have recently found out that if they package their cooking gas into smaller cylinders that are more portable, um, they're really able to increase the accessibility uh, for women. I wasn't able to find a picture, but speaking of, of size in that way, I do know there's a mini grid um, project in Zambia where they actually went back to the supplier of a groundnut processing machine and said, can you please make this you know, smaller and more portable? That's what a lot of the female customers um, want and are interested and, and the, uh, the supplier, in fact, went, um, went ahead and did that. Uh, next slide. Um, so in addition to physical differences, what most people focus on are the social differences. Um, so women and men tend to have distinct uh, work characteristics. And because appliances and energy you know, essentially help perform work, um, it's really important to understand the differences and the work that men and women, you know, typically do and what's expected of them. So obviously in, in most societies, uh, women are responsible for a greater share of domestic work. Um, in many societies, uh, women and men are both involved in agricultural work and farming, but they may have 
slightly distinct roles within the farming. For example, there's some crops that are typically male cultivated or female cultivated, depending, and there can be different. Um, for example, men tend to be more involved in cash crops and women tend to be more involved in production for local markets or for their own consumption. Um, there's even gendering in terms of the steps of agricultural production, whereas men are more involved in tillage. And for example, oftentimes women or children are more involved in weeding. Um, so these are things that are going to vary a lot between um, different contexts. But if you look at any one context, there's a high probability that you will find gender differences. Um, same for em employment and entrepreneurship. Uh, men and women both have businesses and, and work in businesses, but uh, these, their businesses tend to cluster in different sectors. There's tend to be differences in, in size. Um, women are more likely to have home-based businesses rather than formal premises, et cetera, et cetera. And then in general, there's other, there's other work issues that are distinct. Um, time use surveys from around the world show that uh, women um, spend more time doing, during, doing work on an average day. Um, they're more likely to be multitaskers and having to juggle multiple activities at the same time. And uh, women tend to be less mobile than men, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, next slide. Um, some other socially driven differences I wanted to just point out have to do with safety. Uh, <clears throat> women also uh, often will have small children uh, nearby them. So if a <clears throat> machine is very noisy or <clears throat> has a lot of exposed moving parts or is, is perceived as dangerous in any way, um, that can discourage women from using that machine because they're you know, worried about the children who are often close by. Sometimes women have longer hair, more flowing clothes. Um, all these things also need to be taken into account um, when, when designing machines and appliances. Uh, next slide. Uh, some other differences. Um, this is getting a little more into the social design, the business model delivery aspects. Um, but there, you know, households are not monolithic. Uh, there's going to be bargaining between different members of the household in terms of what to buy and how to pay for it, how it's going to be used, etc. And if there's a gender power dynamic and one person has more bargaining power than the other you know, <clears throat> that can come out in some of these negotiations. Um, so even thinking about, uh, you know, design of appliance or, or delivery models, you know, there's some important questions to ask, like, are there things um, that maybe women want, but there's no expressed market demand for just because they have less purchasing power? And can we try and uncover what these are? Or, you know, what are the design choices that can be made to help, you know, fit better into the existing bargaining processes that exist so we can work with them, you know, or so that we can try and change them. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here are, um, there's a list of like 10 or so design considerations that I wanted to uh, put to you as you think about including gender in your projects. You know, first off is, how was the need for this appliance uh, identified? You know, who provided input? Who asked for it? Um, who tested it? Under what conditions was it tested? Does it really reflect, um, you know, who's, or it, it doesn't have to reflect everyone's needs, but just, you know, be aware of um, who's, whose needs and, and conditions is this appliance directly responding to? Um, another question is, you know, does it help uh, women or does it help men or both uh, with their existing work that they have to do? Or in some cases, could this device provide like a mechanical advantage to let a woman do a job that maybe um, traditionally uh, norms wouldn't really allow her to be doing? Uh, is it is the device or appliance <clears throat> is it comfortable and safe, you know, for women's bodies, you know, when used and safe for children if they're they're around? Um, is it easily portable, or is it uh, equipment that can be used in like a home-based uh, business setting? Um, and then, yeah, is it compatible with uh, with child rearing and, and multitasking? <clears throat> you know, it's it's great. Uh, you know, women with uh, young children or women who have um, a series of who have a lot of children, you know, they spend a lot of time breastfeeding, and a machine that you can operate with one hand is um, is really useful in those situations and allows you to get a lot more work done. So, you know, one more thing to think about. Uh, next slide. 
Um, is the, is the appliance, is it attractive to, to women? Um, sometimes from a purchasing, you know, perspective, uh, it's really important to just design something that is aesthetically pleasing, you know, whatever that means in the, in the given context. And also, is it attractive, you know, to men who might be the ones actually making the purchasing decision? Is it something that they would want, you know, their spouse to have if it's a situation where men are typically the deciders? Um, and then even, uh, it's never too early to start thinking about appropriation risks um, and how they might be able to be um, mitigated. For example, if a technology relies on mobile phones or banking and in your particular context, um, you know, spouses don't like other spouses to have mobile phones or you see large discrepancies in terms of account ownership. Um, you might try and think of a way to, to, to mitigate that so that the technology is, um, you know, not appropriated by one gender or the other. Um, same thing for maintenance. <clears throat> you know, if it's very difficult for an individual to maintain a machine, um, it's also difficult for them to maintain ownership and control over that machine because they're dependent on, on others um, for the upkeep. And, and that's one channel where appropriation tends to, um, to rear its head. Uh, another thing to think about just in terms of um, eventual impact monitoring is, you know, is this appliance likely to change relationships and social dynamics? Um, is it going to improve gender equality um, or not really have an effect? Um, and lastly, what else is needed to accompany this appliance? Um, do, are there any additional pieces that need to be in place to ensure from a socio-technical perspective um, that that everything is there to really make it to make it work. You know, you can't obviously parachute uh, a device into a setting um, without some external supports to um, to facilitate its adoption. And that's that's all that I really have um, today. I'm sorry if I ran a bit over time, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. It was uh, an amazing presentation. Thanks for giving us this uh, overview and historical background and set some light on um, yeah, those considerations, so important. I encourage everybody to share comments and questions uh, for any of the speakers today, and we will pick the, quest the, yeah, the questions at the end in the Q&A, but please start um, asking the questions as it comes before you forget. Um, now I want to give the space for Richard to talk us about disability and energy access. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, great. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Richard Goyal from Energy Saving Trust. And uh, one of the research that we are undertaking is to understand the intersection of um, disability and enabling access to electrical appliances in, in rural operated regions. Um, and that, that can have a uh, you know, few different angles that, that need exploring. Um, for example, uh, what are the uh, assistive technologies uh, that that these people might need that might need to be powered electrically. Uh, what are the design changes we can already do uh, to make these appliances more accessible? Uh, something like Janine spoke of just now, um, and and I find a high degree of overlap between uh, certain design changes that can make appliances more gender inclusive. Uh, that Janine was talking about. Uh, and and you know a similar similar suite of design changes in in commercial appliances can also make them disability inclusive. We'll get into some of that in a bit, um, and uh, I will also talk a little bit about how you can make uh, the research that you conduct uh, more disability inclusive. Um, so the, these are all parts of early insights from an ongoing study on uh, on on disability. Um, Next slide, please, Jackie. So let's let's just start with quantifying the problem. Um, I have to admit that the numbers are uh, very um, are uh, are not robust and certainly not available at a country level, much less at a at a urban uh, rural level. 
Um, there are some dated numbers uh, published by WHO and, and country censuses uh, that I've tried to cite here to bring home the problem. But even with these very large aggregated numbers, the, the problem is quite stark. Um, so 15% of the global population lives with some form of disability. This is an old uh, WHO number from 2010 census numbers. Um, and certainly since from then to now, the numbers have um, increased, must have increased by a lot. Um, and uh, uh, these numbers are also underrepresented, not just because they are dated, but also because 40% of people in low income countries aged over 60 years have some form of disability because they may not get access to adequate health care um, or might be nutritionally poor and um, not getting adequate family care, etc. Similarly, persons with disabilities, I'll just call them PWDs for, from now, with psychosocial disabilities are, are dramatically undercounted in country censuses. This is because a lot of countries may not even recognize, for example, depression as a, as a disability. And generally, there's a lack of consensus on, on the definition of disability. So uh, in, in terms of the way a census is defined, uh, the disability identification can be different and therefore undercounted in few countries. Then in general, disabilities are quite disproportionately spread as well and in favor of low-income countries. So uh, there is a UN estimate that suggests that 80% of the world's disabled populations are in developing countries. So that's huge. You know, when you say, I mean, that that's 15% of the global population of which 80% is in developing countries. And one reason for that is not being able to afford a nutritionally dense diet with adequate protein. There are also gender differences and rural urban disparities. So Mitra et al. in their 2013 study, and I'm sorry, I've not included that citation here, but they did a study across 15 developing countries that found that uh, disability in working age women were higher than that of men. Uh, and a probable cause, again, attributed to poor diets uh, in women as compared to men. And also with disabled populations uh, uh, were greater in rural regions than in urban regions in at least 11 of 15 countries where they looked. Next slide, please, Jackie. So this, this is a plot that I took from the UN flagship report on disability and development. It's a very interesting report. I'd encourage you all of you to look. What they did was they, they mapped how disability can be addressed by different SDGs. And it, uh, this, this graph is interesting because it shows that in at least 37 out of these 44 countries, households with persons with disabilities had lower access to electricity than households without persons with disabilities. So certainly there is a, there is a case that uh, disabled persons' households uh, even in rural regions, uh, might will have lower levels of electricity access, maybe because they are unemployed or their uh, household level incomes are, are lower than uh, other households. Uh, the report recognized four key areas where, where there is an energy access um, issue with, with the disabled that must that needs to be looked at. First of all, you have to enable access to the disabled. Uh, access to energy. The second is that it it the access to energy should should be able to take care of the electricity demands of assistive technologies because um, and this this needs to be over and above the electric electricity demand they'd need for regular appliances. Then access to modern forms of energy which are less polluting for the household. Janine was saying that women tend to spend more time indoors or or, ha, or be uh, employed in productive pursuits that can be operated from homes. This is similar for persons with disabilities. They tend to spend a lot of time indoors, either because they are not as mobile, they might need, they are dependent, or they are, they are it's just because of social stigma and you know marginalization on those accords. Um, and so because they're indoors, they are exposed to greater amounts of pollution. Um, so this is particularly apparent in, in cooking. Uh, I mean, traditional fuels used from cooking or traditional fuels used for lighting. So um, for smaller appliances, home appliances, where traditional fuels are being used, they, they have a higher degree of exposure. Lastly, this report also says that affordable energy um, should be made available to, to these persons with, with disabled. Um, next slide, please, Jackie.
So um, these, uh, these are a few of the assistive uh, devices. You'll see some of these in pictures. Some of them you'll be able, easily be able to recognize. Um, as we, we are all quite familiar with manual assistive technologies like canes, sticks, chairs for showers. Um, I had myself installed some handrails and grab grab bars in, in the bathrooms for my father. Um, prosthetics, manual wheelchairs are, are very, very, um, the, but I, I won't really say ubiquitous, but quite easily accessible. Um, and truly a lot of the aid money on disability is focused on these manual devices. However, there's a big world of assistive technologies out there that needs to be electrically powered, such as electric wheelchairs, braille displays, education devices, um, hearing aids, etc. And these are more expensive. Their availability is even more limited in rural regions because of lack of modern markets and infrastructure, lack of adequate electricity access, affordability issues, lack of awareness in some cases about the existence of some of these devices. For example, there are, you know, these um, uh, fall detectors. If 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 a person falls, it can be detected, and that can be troubleshooted. Or you know, uh, um, um, and and in general, where the per capita access to appliances is low, families certainly tend to deprioritize purchase of assistive technologies for disabled members. Um, I've included a web link here for um, for the uh, priority uh, assistive technologies list that is published by WHO. For those of you who are curious, please, please do go and take a look. Um, uh, there's this lady, Sai Kajima of the UN Desa. She estimates that 44% of the WHO priority assistive products need to be powered by electricity or batteries. So that kind of, uh, you know, uh, helps put that overlap of a program like LEA, which is our program, the Low Energy Inclusive Appliances Program, that focuses on electrical appliances to to kind of see that there is there is a very broad range of AT or assistive technologies that need to be powered by electricity. Uh, next slide, please. In this slide, um, I'm going to be talking very briefly on the design changes that can make conventional appliances more disability accessible. And I have to say that some of the things that the previous speaker, Janine, was talking about are equally applicable here. For instance, the height of various productive use appliances will be important. Um, in, in the case of dis disabled persons, uh, you know, uh, uh, especially persons with mobility disabled, um, uh, the, if the height uh, could be adjusted, it and certainly will add to the cost of making the height of um, tables or appliances adjusted where it can be. Um, because uh, when, when a person is, is on a wheelchair, there is only a certain height that that person can operate the appliance from. Um, so those kind of considerations um, need to be uh, given. Um, there are also issues with upper body strength um, uh, in certain kinds of disabilities that, that might need to be taken care of. For instance, if it's a refrigerator, um, uh, if uh, you might need to sometimes, and if it's a double door refrigerator, you might sometimes need to switch uh, the freezer compartment to, to the lower portion so that the disabled person can easily access it. Um, then several tools that help target visual disability um, also help with few other disabilities, such as those that come under the broader umbrella term of print disability. Uh, the reasons for print disability, print disability is when you're not able to read. Um, and the reasons for print disability vary, but may include things like vision impairment or blindness, of course, but also physical dexterity problems, such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, arthritis or paralysis. Uh, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, uh, I, I have written certain recommendations here for, for visual, for, for design changes that can be considered for making appliances inclusive or visually dis or print disabled. So providing text option in Braille, using colorblind friendly palettes, use of textured materials so that you can uh, tell the difference from one material or one part to another by the difference in texture using different shapes instead of colors um, to tell apart different parts, et cetera. So there are, there are a few things one can look into and certainly borrow design ideas from the developed world where a lot of this thinking is already being taken in, uh, into account. Um, 
Braille, Braille, uh, the use of Braille is is a little bit tricky because there are both, you know, there are also cons of using Braille. It, it adds to an expense. It is an extra expense, but it also adds bulk to the paper because it takes up a lot of space. Um, and and some rural uh, um, per persons with disabilities may not be trained in Braille. So um, the context uh, and the geography where the plans would be sold should certainly be ev evaluated to 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 uh, before before making some of these um, uh, design changes in the plans. Um, then um, use of both light and sound indicators is is an obvious one. Uh, one thing that you should also consider is that if if in the appliances you are designing, you're also creating a supportive website or an app uh, that the users will be able to use, or you know even agents that are marketing your products at the last mile are using that that may have some kind of a disability, especially in a firm which is more conscious and is also you know has a has a balance in their staff of disabled persons. Um, then uh, you should you should uh, there are design guidelines available for making inclusive website design which are available on the web content access accessibility guidelines um, certainly something that you should uh, look at Google uh, you know and and many other internet companies uh, have already started to look into this um, next slide please and then this is my last slide where I just talk about few uh, ideas of how you can conduct research on the field so that you can uh, be uh, disability inclusive. Um, so you should certainly uh, incorporate disabled people in your research design as respondents. And then the data on numbers and types of disabilities is quite sparse, like I said before. So um, it is it is important to work in standardized disability questions and surveys. And uh, the Washington group of set of questions is is a is a great, great resource which has this list of questions which are great for identifying different disabled persons, but also understanding if, if they are employed or not. And then you should talk to family members and caretakers of the disabled as well for their insights and understanding what challenges a disabled person might face in accessing an appliance. Um, so a nice strategy are dyads or conducting two interviews per household. So kind of do, do, a, do an interview with a disabled person, but also with the caretaker. Recruitment of disabled persons is something that uh, should, you know, sh some thought, careful thought needs to be put into because there are so many different types of disabilities and they can be scattered um, quite heavily. Um, so that can pose a challenge. Um, women with disabilities can be further withdrawn and harder to recruit. So in, in such cases, taking a smaller sample size and doing more focused and long conversations combined with observation will help. Um, a second method of recruiting disabled persons is to go via what we call as DPOs or disabled persons organizations. These are often, you know, they're in all countries, in all cities, and um, um, in all regions. And, and uh, a lot of the disabled persons from rural regions are recruited into the DPOs. So um, that's a great way to find concentrated numbers of lots of disabled people and conducting the study via, via them. Um, then uh, research ethics is, is an important thing to look into. So having consent forms in few different formats uh, is, is something you should think of. Verbal consent is also valid in case of disabled persons. And uh, for people with learning disabilities, if they are not engaged in that conversation, that can be, that should be, um, you know, taken as as a as a withdrawal of consent. Um, then, um, lastly, uh, you know, for for persons with disabilities, you could do easy. You, you should design easy uh, to reach consent forms and talk it through with the person in simple broken down steps. Um, that is all I had um, for today. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Rita. Um, it was very useful and helped us to understand better how design of appliances can benefit from considering all users' challenges. Um, please share any questions in the, in the chat and Rita will be able to answer uh, later. I would like to give the floor now to Katrina Pili to talk us about the social inclusion. 
Great, thank you, Jackie. And thank you all. I'd, I'd just like to begin by congratulating you and thanking you for your interest and your work on this really important topic around efficient appliances for energy access. Um, it's a really exciting space and, and thank you for doing what you're doing. So to begin uh, in just defining social inclusion and making sure we're all on the same page. So social inclusion is the process of improving the terms on which individuals and groups participate in society. This includes improving the ability, opportunity, and dignity of those disadvantaged on the basis of their identity. And how this links to you is that your judges criteria include things specifically linked to social inclusion, including how well your design considered a sustainable development goal commitment to leave no one behind, in particular gender and disability. So if you go to the next slide, Jackie, um, here really thinking about social inclusion, it's the right thing to do, but it also makes sense when we look at this from a macro level. If you leave social inclusion unaddressed, this can be very costly to individuals so they can actually have loss of wages, overall reduction in lifetime earning, impact negatively on their education and their employment, and then specifically looking at racism, discrimination, and mental health, those have unique, in addition, um, negative impacts. When you zoom out and you look at this at a national level, you also have an economic cost to social inclusion, which can be captured by foregone gross domestic product and reduction in human capital. Next slide. So I mentioned that one of your criteria touches on this idea of leave no one behind. And the leave no one behind agenda is anchored in the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this has been really embraced by national governments, including the UK, who really, I think, sums it up quite nicely, where they say that they will prioritize the interests of the world's most vulnerable and disadvantaged, the poorest of the poor, and those people who are most excluded and at risk of violence and discrimination. And when we think about the link to social inclusion, in every country, some groups confront barriers that can prevent them from fully participating. And these groups are excluded and disadvantaged, including the list you see here on the slide. So the poorest, those living in remote communities who also are called last mile communities or customers or users, women, the disabled, and those that are displaced. And this includes the almost 71 million people who've been forcibly displaced either internally or as migrants and refugees. Next slide, please. So given the established connection between access to clean energy and socioeconomic development, as you know, there's a real urgent need to accelerate the pace of energy access growth while keeping very close attention to these populations that are at risk of being left behind. And so the appliances that you will design are key to ensuring that this energy enables that development. Recent estimates show that 112 million people will not be able to afford access to electricity in 2030 based on our current trajectory. And many of these last mile households live on under $4 a day. And because of this, they're not being served by the current commercial off-grid energy services, which includes appliances. Further, estimates suggest that there's a $4 billion gap between the ability of households to pay for these products and services and their current pricing structure. Designing energy efficient appliances for these communities is truly key to unlocking sustainable development and economic growth. And social inclusion is a very important element to the appliance design. And again, thank you for the work that you're doing here. Because we need to look at these gaps and you need to ensure that a suite of solutions are tailored to electrifying and providing clean cooking to these last mile communities with social inclusion at the center. Next slide, please. There are four key issues that I'd like to touch on, and, and some of this are, are echoes of what you heard from uh, Jackie and Risha, and so uh, I hope that you will consider these as underlines to these important points. The first is on human-centered design. The second is on affordability. The third, productive use of energy. And the fourth, accessibility. Next slide, please. So when you think about human-centered design, this is really important to come at it from your customer. So knowing the customer and designing from their point of view and be as specific as you can. Think about how they'll interact with or use the appliance that you're designing. 
what about the customer's life experience would impact their usability of the appliance? And this touches on gender and disability. Further, are there cultural elements? So particularly in cooking, there was an assessment that was done of five different stoves in refugee camps, and it showed that the most technically efficient stove was actually the least preferred. And so thinking about this, not just from a technical standpoint, but again, knowing the customer and putting them at the center of your design process. And then finally, what constraints in their life may actually impact their ability to use the appliance? And that can again come from thinking about those disadvantaged groups and those at that last mile. And so try not to be driven by a single issue focus. Think about the customer holistically. Next slide, please. The second is on affordability. So when you think about understanding affordability and the design of your appliance, it's very important to be informed so that you can actually have um, a strong potential impact in the sector through customers being able to purchase and use your product. So when you think about the initial purchase and also the continued use, this can both be challenging for these last mile households. So estimates show that in countries that are still working towards their energy access goals, affordability affects 57% of those who already have access. And so this means that even though they may have access to electricity, they may not be able to afford that appliance or that product that could actually deliver livelihood or economic growth or direct benefits to their health and their family. So this hinders the positive impact of your potential product because it's not able to be ubiquitously used. Among households using an off-grid solar product today, approximately half are below tier one access, which as you know, is commonly defined as the minimum service level to qualify as electricity access. So thinking about that ladder and how does your appliance further enable someone to move up that energy access ladder? Next slide, please. And just to put a finer point on affordability, thinking about affordability and gender. You heard um, Jenny talk a bit about this, and so I'll, I'll move a bit quickly on this slide, but it's important to think about the gender dimension around both the ability to pay and the willingness to pay. Research actually shows that the willingness to pay for a solar device is generally lower among female-headed households than male-headed households. An example in Niger is that female-headed households tended to pay dramatically less for solar home systems than male-headed households, particularly for those low capacity systems. So thinking about the decisions around what appliance to purchase is often gendered. What you see is that the user of the appliance very well might not be that person who has the ability to make the decision to, to buy it, or even then who retains ownership of it. The other piece to this is not just understanding what someone's willing to pay, but what they're able to pay. And this is quite important as you think again about the idea of who is your user and what is their ability to use that product over time. What we saw in, in looking at the Global Leap uh, results-based finance program in East Africa is that 68% of the customers were men. And you think about that from a customer perspective. So they had the ability to pay for the product, but we don't actually know if they're the ones using it. And understanding that is very important because that then leads to the impact and the design of your appliance. Next slide, please. So the next slide that we'll talk about is on productive use of energy. And, and again, you've heard some of this from my colleagues, but it's important to realize that women and men generally use energy differently, <clears throat> both at home and at work. And so these productive use appliances and equipment deliver different benefits. So really here, the, the thing I'd mentioned, because you've, you've heard this echoed by um, my colleagues, is that it's important to think about the ways that women are going to use your appliance or your equipment. And here's a good example that the appliances that uh, Tanzania research found is that men typically use higher electricity uh, devices. Women tend to use more um, traditional, so firewood, mechanical, process heat. And so the appliances look different the fuels they run on are different. And again, that informs the ability and uh, the access to the right appliances and equipment that these users have. So when you think about that from your design perspective, really keep front and center, who is your customer? Who are you trying to reach and how can you reach them effectively? 
the last bullet on the slide is important when you think about, again, the type of customer, if you're designing for a business, you know, small business or medium sized business, that the businesses men and women operate also tend to look different. So in informal or street food production and sectors that really are dominated by women, process heat and mechanical power are significant. It's not just going to be your electric powered appliance. Next slide, please. The fourth um, important consideration is accessibility. And this is really just um, highlighting what you just heard from my colleague, as Risha said. The numbers that you see on the slide are a bit dated and they are uh, quite low compared to what we expect to see. What's important here is that these populations um, face unique gaps around productive uses of energy. And when you think about the role that these appliances and equipment can play in income generation, in changing stigmas and empowering these populations, it's very important. So thinking about how you can consider making your appliances more inclusive. When you think about electric cooking or other appliances, really think about your customer. If they're visually disabled, how would they interact with your screen, with your operations panel? Um, when you think about other um, elements that Risha mentioned, really putting accessibility from the customer's point of view front and center is really important to reaching these populations. And, and as you heard her mention, 80% of the persons with disabilities live in developing countries. So these really are um, important users and important customers. So my final slide is just a big thank you again to reiterate um, for your work. It's very exciting and we're here to answer questions and are happy to uh, be part of your journey. So thank you so much. Thank you a lot, Katrina, for this great presentation and sharing all these insights so important uh, when it comes to design appliances and hopefully uh, all the information shared today by the three speakers uh, will be used for uh, design and appliance uh, within the uh, efficiency for access design challenge uh, this year. Um, please share any questions uh, on the on the chat box. In the meantime, um, I want to I would like to ask the speakers, um, what do you see is the role that product design can play in achieving um, equity in general in the sector? Who would like to answer that? This is Katrina. I mean, I, I think I can take a first shot and, and really say what you heard um, from all three of us, I think, is that equity is enabled by products like, you know, energy efficient appliances and equipment. Um, but to really succeed in that enabling, you have to put your customer at the center and you have to think about gender, social inclusion, disability, customers at the last mile. Um, and be very conscious when you're in that design phase. And then also as you move through your process, be very conscious to keep these questions front of mind. Um, and I think it was Risha that said, you know, try when you're engaging with your customers, try to engage with them, but also, you know, who else is in their ecosystem? Who else is in their orbit? Um, and really try to make sure that as you think about that equity, think about how your project can enable that. Hi, Thanks, I Katrina. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo what Katrina says. And in addition, especially for disability, um, uh, you know, if I mean, um, if I if I'm to draw the parallel between access and use of assistive technologies versus making uh, regular appliances more disabled friendly. Uh, I would certainly prioritize assistive technologies because without that, uh, you uh, disabled persons um, will find it very challenging to um, to to be included um, in 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 social contra constructs, but also in in employment scenarios. Um, so uh, so assistive technologies would be extremely key. Um, to the extent that appliance uh, access is is um, really hinges on a certain appliance design, 
um, it can also really challenge uh, a person's playing uh, an active income contribution role in a household. Um, I mean, for certain types of disabilities, um, ability to work from home uh, or being employed from home um, is very important. Um, and so having to the extent that electrical appliances can help generate income for them, uh, it would be also important to, to ensure that um, they are designed in a way that these people can uh, access them. Hi, this is Jenny. I definitely wholeheartedly agree with what was um, said before by Risha and Katrina. Um, I, I imagine it kind of as this two-pronged approach that every time you're creating something, um, you can think about this is an opportunity to get an individual to do something that they either couldn't or wouldn't or weren't allowed to do before. So it's life expanding. It's it's opening up new opportunities for people, but then it can't just stay with that. Um, you know, going back to the discussion of like the plow, it has to be inscribed within breaking down like division of labor, whether it's male, female, or urban, rural, or, you know, between, you know, individuals who are differently abled. Um, you know, it all has to be inscribed within the democratization of, um, of technology. So those are my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, um, the three of you, for these um, great um, final points. I'm afraid we are running out of time. And uh, I just want to say that uh, to the participants that we value your feedback. So um, when this webinar will finish, you will have a pop-up window to respond a very short survey uh, that will help us to improve for future webinars. Um, at this point, I just want to remind you that a recording of this webinar will be available on the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge website in case you want to revisit some of the examples and interesting information you listened here today. And uh, our next webinar is focused on understanding the end users and will explore the importance and opportunities of having the end users at the center of the design. And it will take place next Friday, 23rd of October at 10 a.m. Um, UK time. Thank you all of you and see you on our next webinar and special thanks to our three panelists today. Have a nice day. <laughs>